Okay, so the next lecture is on autoencoders. And in the previous lecture, we, we saw that how we can use classical computer vision algorithms to extract features from images, right? We, we studied HOG histogram of gradients. We studied SIF features. We studied how we can detect key points in your images. Now, autoencoder is kind of, we are shifting gears and we are moving from classical computer vision to let's say the learning-based uh, approaches or data-driven approaches, which is towards deep learning. And of course, there are a lot of different ways to extract features in deep learning as well. Autoencoder is one of them. And it's like the one of the simplest way as well. So we'll start with this. Okay, so the, the core idea of autoencoder is, as the name suggests, you whatever input you have, you learn features from that input, and then you try to reconstruct that input okay so that's the that's the core idea and the way you do this is you have your input sample and you try to learn some meaningful features okay and using that could be fully connected layers that could be your cnn convolution layers or like any any other way so you learn those features and then you use those features to again reconstruct that input data and if you're able to do that it means the features are good because then they're capturing the information about your input sample, right? That's, that's why they're able to reconstruct it. Now, some key features here should be when you are learning those features, the, the size of those features should be pretty small as compared to your input data. Otherwise, what you can do is you can just, you can just copy like all the pixel values. Let's say if, uh, the, if, the, if the input is image, you can just copy all those values and, uh, you, you say that, okay, this is my feature. And since we are just, just copied, you can do the reconstruction as well. Okay, but those are not good features. So what you want is we want like features in a compressed format where the number of values is like far less than your input dimensionality. Now, another interesting aspect of autoencoders is this, this falls like somewhere like in unsupervised learning regime. And the reason is you don't need any annotations. All you need is data. If you have some image, you don't need any annotation on that. You don't care like what objects are present in that image because you don't need those labels to train the model. You have the data point, let's say you have the image. All you need is the same image itself like to train your model because you will train your model using reconstruction loss. Okay, so this is kind of not completely unsupervised because you have a loss function to train it, but unsupervised in a sense that you don't need annotations. Okay, but still you will, you will have a loss function, you will compute the loss values, you will compute the gradients, and you, you are going to train your model. Okay, so you have that supervision uh, in, in autoencoders. Okay, so supervised, as I said, you will need some kind of labels or annotations. And one simple example is if you are doing image classification, for each image, you should know what object is present in that image to be able to train your model. The, the basic uh, architecture you have for autoencoder is, it's just basically two parts. The first is encoder, the second is decoder. Uh, and again, this is just uh, at conceptual level. Level mean you can have any kind of uh, encoders, you can have any kind of decoders. And again, it depends on the data. Okay, so autoencoder, it's not like very specific to images. It can be applied to any, any, uh, any, any domain. If you have video, then you can have autoencoders. You can have autoencoders for like a text kind of input as well for language or maybe audio signal. Okay. So the basic structure looks uh, something like this. You have this uh, input data. In this case, it could be some feature vector. It could be images. It could be a video. And you have your encoder head, which takes like this uh, as input. And it tries to like compress that input to a very small like dimensional uh, dimensionality space okay so that's called the code and then what you do is you use that code to again reconstruct the same input which is shown as uh, x prime here. okay so when you do re uh, do that reconstruction then what you can do is you can actually estimate how good that reconstruction was because you have that input here okay so you can just compare like this input with the output, and you can use that to, co to, to compute your loss. So that could be your uh, training loss when you train this kind of model. Okay, so this part is called encoder, and this part is called decoder. 
So this will be like the basic uh, structure of any autoencoder you design. Now, in the I think in one of the lectures we were also talking about uh, PCA and singular value decomposition, where we we saw that PCA is like a very good way to compress your features and to represent your to represent uh, represent your data samples, and uh, we we also discussed like how that was used when I think the first time we uh, we went to Moon, the images were sent like the PCA was used because the images were compressed. And then only a few values were sent over, and then the image was actually reconstructed. Okay, so PCA is a uh, very, very powerful and effective in that. And in that sense, it has like correlation. You can say like some kind of relation to PCA because even in autoencoders, we are trying to compress uh, that uh, the, the size of the features, right? So we are only trying to learn very, very important set of features which are sufficient to actually do the reconstruction. Right. So th there's some comparison you can uh, make between these two, uh, which is, I think, fine because uh, PCA, the idea is you try to learn like the most prominent, uh, you can say like most prominent properties you, you have in your data. And then you do some kind of linear combination of those properties to define your objects. And autoencoders, uh, it's like uh, trying to do the same thing. But in this case, uh, we are trying to actually learn it from, from the data, right? In, in that case, it's not learning, you're just extracting what is there. Okay, PC, I mean, it's a known algorithm, right? You have a certain set of steps, I mean, there's no learning involved. Okay, so what you can do is you can define your encoders and decoders from an autoencoder as a function. And let's say uh, your encoder is function F, and x is your input so you will send your uh, input to the function f the encoder and h let's say is your latent space then let's say this is your uh, original uh, input image x uh, f is your encoder function then this will be your latent representation and then again you can represent your decoder as a function where you send in like this latent code as input for example in this case like g is your decoder and which will give you R, which is the reconstruction of the input. Okay, so in this case, it will try to reconstruct four. Now again, you can have a lot of variations of autoencoders. You can have shallow autoencoders, which means like only few layers. In this case, you just have one layer in encoder and one layer in the uh, decoder. Or you can have very deep networks where you can have several layers in your encoder and several layers in your decoder. And most of the time, it's kind of asymmetric. You have like similar kind of structure uh, on the encoder, and you just try to mimic that when you while you decode your latent code. But of course, that's not like a requirement. You can have variations there as well. Okay. Now, as I said, like uh, autoencoder, you can have fully connected layers. You can have CNNs. You can have something else as well. And this is like a very standard CNN auto, uh, CNN based autoencoder where you have uh, input images. And in this case, it's a grayscale image. So what you do is uh, you have these convolution layers. And the idea is you try to compress like your features to get like a very small latent code. In this case, uh, you have, let's say 28 cross 28, this con is giving you 14 cross 14 cross 32. Again, you have some max pooling, you have convolution. Again, max pooling convolution. You are keep you are, you're reducing like uh, your activation maps, and at then you can flatten it. I mean, you did that in your first assignment, so you should know all of this. And at then you can have more fully connected layers, which will let's say uh, give you this latent code, which has just ten different values. Okay, so it's kind of a combination between uh, CNN and fully connected layer. And here you can see that the total number of pixel values uh, you have in your input data that was 28 times 28. But this encoder is actually reducing that to just 10 different values, which means this is kind of a good autoencoder. And then what you do is, in this case, it's kind of symmetrical to like your encoder. You take th those values, again, you have uh, fully connected layers, then you can do reshaping, and again, you can perform convolution operation, then you can do 
upscaling or you can also do maybe there is a deconvolution operation but again don't worry about it uh, you don't have to understand this uh, at this point of time but basically what you can do is uh, once you reshape you can perform convolution on that right so to increase the resolution you can just upsample it or you can say you can repeat the pixel values so like max pooling was reducing the activation uh, map size so it was just doing if it's max pooling it will pick the maximum value if it's average pooling it will just take the average right so upsampling you just repeat that value okay and then again you can perform convolution again you can do upsampling convolution until you have the desired resolution which should mimic uh, the input data point and you can easily train this thing you can actually uh, maybe use a uh, MSC loss which is mean squared loss you can also use binary cross entropy loss all of that is fine the idea is you can compute like that loss like uh, pixel wise for each pixel you can compute a loss depending upon whether the pixel was reconstructed correctly or not so a very simple loss could loss could be like elven loss okay so the way it will work is for each pixel you will just subtract like what your network has uh, reconstructed with the original image so just, it's just like x1 minus x2 and you just average that over all the pixels and that could be your elven loss okay you can also compute l2 loss which is same as like msc loss okay so that's like a basic structure uh, of your uh, cnn uh, based autoencoder and let me show you some interesting examples so this is the funny part so we we have an autoencoder uh, again like something similar to what i showed in the last slide and your input was image uh, images which are of shape 28 cross 28 and now in this particular example what we are uh, showing you we are trying to compress this to just two different values in the previous we were trying to compress into 10 different values but instead of 10 we are compressing just to two values okay so that's like a lot of compression and now let's see like uh, what autoencoder can give you the top row is your original image okay and then you train your autoencoder using these images where the latent code is just two values and the second row is actually showing you the reconstructed images so you'll be amazed by like just two values are actually capturing all the information you have let's say for this shoe and it's able to reconstruct it okay these are like 28 cross 28 pixels which means like just two values are sufficient and in this case you can see like the shape is completely preserved by just using two numbers and you can see the fine details are gone right this is like a very complex logo but when you can't save that logo in just two numbers so that's completely gone so those fine level details even here you can see like they are completely gone but the overall structure is still preserved in most of these cases okay so that's i think that's really interesting and if you compare that with like pca reconstruction which we were uh, discussing in one of the earlier lecture again this is not so bad because two numbers is like pretty pretty uh, high compression right but it's still it's doing uh, a fine job but not as good as your uh, autoencoder reconstruction okay so that's like uh, one way to see how powerful these autoencoders can be and now so that was fine now the interesting aspect is why are they useful okay. so what you can do is you can use autoencoders to actually perform feature learning and you can see that when you don't even need labels for these you can just train using uh, your, your data, unlabeled data. And the way you will extract features is once you have trained your autoencoder, you will just discard this decoder because you don't care about uh, reconstruction. All we care about uh, is these 10 values. And what will happen is given any input image, this encoder will be able to give you these 10 values, which you can use as features for that particular image. Okay. And this kind of like features you can use in a lot of lot of applications. Uh, one simple uh, application is, for example, image retrieval. And this is something which you also use for your, um, let's say, Google image search or Bing image search. And the, the idea here is we have a lot of images in our database. 
okay, millions of billions of trillions of images. What you can do is the encoder you have trained, you can actually use that encoder to extract like a feature vector for all these images. Okay. And again, that, that feature vector, I mean, I showed 10 numbers, but it's up to you. Like it depends how complex your image is, but still that will be a lot of com uh, compression, right? So instead of saving like trillion of images, if you just use that encoder and save those values, that will reduce like your, uh, your disk space cost, right? You just have to store those numbers then instead of these images. So how image retrieval will work is you will have some query image. You will say, okay, Google image, let's find like uh, more images like this. And then what it will do is it will take this image, take that uh, trained encoder, again, extract those features. And in the back end, it will just try to match those features with all the features which are extracted from these images. And the, the feature to which it will like, the, it, 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 it will give you like the closest distance, then you can just retrieve that image and that will be your response. Okay, so that's how image retrieval works. And, but you can see that it was, once you have that trained autoencoder, it's pretty straightforward, right? And I think this could be a very interesting course project as well, because we have already learned like how to train these uh, classifiers, but you just have to add this decoder part, right? And of course, like you, you will have an assignment where you have to uh, implement this, but then you can try to extend that to maybe some other problem. For example, image retrieval, right? You can create your own small data set. Uh, it could be from any domain and you can show that how those features are actually working for this problem. So it's not very complicated as well, but I think will be a very good project. Now, some interesting applications of autoencoder uh, since you don't need labels, what you can do is you can take your input image and make it noisy, deliberately add some noise to that image. Okay. And then again, learn the latent code, use decoder to reconstruct. So when you're reconstructing, don't, don't reconstruct the noisy image, reconstruct the original image, which was the clean image, because you only have that clean image. Right? You use that clean image to get this noisy input. And just train this autoencoder. And then what will happen is it will be kind of a denoiser for you. So during test time, if you have some image which is kind of noisy, so what this autoencoder will do is you will feed in the no noisy image, but it will be able to recover like the clean image for you. And for the, that noisy image, you might not have the clean image. Right? You might just have that noisy image. For example, like some of your photographs, old photographs, uh, which were captured maybe from decades old photos, which are noisy, uh, not very good quality. You can just pass it to like this encoder and it will give you the clean image. And in fact, this is actually used like uh, these days. There are a lot of applications. Uh, applications. I think in Adobe uh, Photoshop, you should have that. So very simple idea, right? And you don't need any labels for this and very, very powerful. And again, this could be a very good uh, course project for you. So I have a couple of these uh, interesting applications of uh, autoencoder. As I said, like this is a very, very simple lecture, but I think a very interesting one. Now in this one, what you can do is, let's say you have a lot of colored images, but deliberately you can just convert them to grayscale. That's pretty straightforward uh, mathematical operation, right? And what you can do is you can train your autoencoder where the input is a grayscale image, but the output is a colored image because you already have the colored image during training, you can just train that network. So what that network is actually doing, it's taking in grayscale image, creating colored images. And because you have the ground truth, you can easily train that using a lot of, lot of samples. And at the end, when that network is trained, again, you can take out like your photos from let's say eighties or nineties when we didn't have, had, have had colors, right? And just pass that image to that network and it will just color that image for you. All right, another interesting application. This is a little complicated, so uh, bear with me. Here, the, the idea is you have like a lot of, lot of clean images, right? Where, so anomaly is something which is kind of something unusual, which you're not expecting. For example, in this scenario, if this is a walkway, right? In, you should not have cars here. For example, you don't have this, you should not have this golf cart here. Okay, so whenever this is, there's something like unusual, that's called like an anomaly. 
And in this case, this uh, golf cart here is anomaly. It shouldn't be here. And that's a very interesting problem because, and it's not just like a problem in image domain. This also ap uh, applies to like, let's say text domain. You have some sentences and something, some word comes up, it should not be there, right? So that's anomaly in text. Now, how you can use autoencoders to solve this uh, problem, you can have a lot of clean images. And you just train your uh, autoencoder uh, on those clean images. Just reconstruct the, the way uh, we were discussing earlier. Okay. Send as input clean image, and you will get the uh, output clean image. Just train it. Now, for animal, de animal detection, what will happen is, if you send like some image to the train model, then what will happen is, if this network was trained for like, let's say this walkway, then if only clean images were used during training, then this kind of object will be something new for the network because the network has never seen this object. And if the network has never seen this object, it will have hard time to reconstruct this object. Okay, so we make use of that information. If the reconstruction is actually bad, the model is failing, then we can say that, okay, something wrong is going on here. All right. So those were like some simple uh, applications and I, I think very, very powerful applications. Uh, we do have those like in, in real world today in a lot of different applications. So some of the properties is like your autoencoders, once they are trained on some data, they're kind of data specific. For example, if you're training your autoencoder on, let's say uh, outdoor images, then that autoencoder will not work for indoor images. Okay, so it's kind of data specific. And that's not very specific to autoencoders. That's like a property of most of the deep learning models. You have some kind of domain shift, the, the models will fail. Uh, the other thing is the reconstruction. Um, I mean, it could be one good uh, application, but most of the times it's kind of lossy because we are losing a lot of information. Uh, I showed you some, uh, one example, right? Where we were compressing into just two numbers and just trying to reconstruct. But again, the shape was preserved, but the but the fine level details, for example, logo on your uh, T-shirt, that was gone. So if if you are merely going to use it for um, high quality reconstruction, then you will have to do something else to actually avoid this loss. Now, now the good thing is it's very easy to train. All you need is just data. You don't have to have like any labels. And if your if your testing scenario is like or from the same domain, you have similar kind of examples. It's going to work pretty well. But for auto distribution samples, it might not work uh, that. Way.